Good evening. I'm Carmenita Higginbotham, Dean of VCU Arts, and I am thrilled to be with you all tonight. It is an honor to be at the forefront of an amazing school that has built and sustained such an impressive reputation in the arts and where the critical thinking and creative skills of our students, faculty, and staff make us uniquely equipped to have an impact in this moment. The support that the Pollock Society provides is essential to promising a strong future for VCU Arts. Thank you to all of our Pollock donors. Your gift means more now than ever before. I would also like to thank the VCU Foundation for the generous support that they have provided to develop the Anderson Virtual Exhibition Suite. We will be highlighting the Anderson Virtual Platform and Programming in the spring and look forward to engaging with you further at that time. Tonight, I am excited to share with you the work of Professor Catherine Roach, an associate professor in the Department of Art History, whose emerging digital techniques make it possible to recreate historic exhibitions. By digitally reconstructing these environments, we can better study visual relationships and gain a more holistic understanding of historical perspectives and attitudes. Professor Roach's research also investigates how people lived with exhibited and interpreted art in the 18th and 19th centuries with an emphasis on British painting and urban exhibition culture. She has curated the exhibition Seeing Double, Portraits, Copies and Exhibitions in the 1820s London. And that was with the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven. And adding to her accolades, her 2016 book titled Pictures Within Pictures in 19th Century Britain received the Historians of British Art Book Award for exemplary scholarship on the period after 1800. She was also awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship at the Huntington Library to support work on her second book. And this will be a history of the British institution. And this is a, a groundbreaking 19th century exhibition society. She has also received a Distinguished Achievement in Research Award from VC, VCU Arts. Professor Roach received her PhD in art history from Columbia University and her BA in art history from Yale University. And I'm also excited to announce that Kate's article titled The Higher Branches, Genre and Race on Display at the British Institution London, 1806, is forthcoming in the journal Art History. She is one of the latest examples of how our faculty are leaders and experts in their fields. And as speaking as an art historian, art history as a journal is a premier publication. So congratulations to her. Also joining us this evening is VCU Arts alumna, Madison Westgate, who was a VCU Arts graphic design student. And she collaborated with Professor Roach or Kate to create the virtual exhibition you will see tonight. Maddie is currently working for a Richmond-based design and branding agency, and it's here that she is applying her talents and skill to create and strengthen powerful brands. Kate and Maddie's collaborate, collaborative work, uh, bringing together faculty and students, scholars and designers, this exemplifies the collaborative spirit that drives our creative and scholarly work at VCU Arts. And after the presentation, Kate and Maddie will join for a question and answer session moderated by Kelly Kerr, and she is the director of events. And we ask that you please submit questions for both Kate and Maddie at any time using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Again, thank you so much for your support and for spending time with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor Catherine Roach. Hello everyone, welcome. I'm thrilled that you're able to join us this evening. Um, and thank you, Dean Higginbotham for that wonderful introduction. I'm really excited to be here to highlight faculty and student collaboration this evening. So we're here tonight to talk about exploring virtual exhibitions. And I hope you can all see on the screen in front of you, a still from the three-dimensional digital recreation that Maddie and I worked on together. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the project and the outcomes um, of our research this, this evening. And I wanna say at the outset that I'm really excited for the question and answer period um, this evening. I really welcome your questions on this topic. So without further ado, 
why study exhibitions? Why do this project in the first place? This is a rare watercolor um, uh, that an artist took the time to sit and recreate the experience of being in a 18th century exhibition in London. And I imagine you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of look. There's a sheer intensity to the imagery here. Um, and this is typical of exhibitions for the period. And they're very different than today's museum settings. So studying these exhibitions give us a window onto what art signified to its original audiences, how people would encounter artworks in what environments and the kinds of purposes they put art to and the kinds of stories they told with art. Um, and studying lost displays also teaches us how placement creates meaning. Uh, how the choice of where to put an object says something about the artwork and about the world around you. In this particular example, we're going to be seeing a lot of equestrian portraits tonight. And this particular equestrian portrait that's at the center of it, it's the largest picture on the wall. It's centrally located. And that is in part because the subject is the Prince of Wales. And so he's the most socially important person in this display and he gets the center billing. And we're very fortunate to have uh, this rare surviving image of a lost or, or ephemeral exhibition. But most 18th and 19th century exhibitions do not have any surviving visual documentation. And so it becomes a challenge for scholars working in this field. How do we study visual dialogues when we have no surviving images? And the answer is virtual exhibitions. Um, so tonight we're giving you a sneak peek of a forthcoming article, um, as, Dean, as the Dean mentioned, um, but this is just one of this kind of project that's going on at VCU right now. Um, the other one other exciting example is the virtual Anderson Gallery, um, and that's something that was supported to the, by the VCU Foundation um, with a grant that gave funding to create a virtual suite to support faculty and student exhibitions. So thank you to the foundation. And I put them here because I like this um, juxtaposition of past and present. Um, and particularly now, um, virtual exhibitions provide a real opportunity for continued engagement and access, um, even in a time of limited mobility. So the organization that I'm working on right now is one that in some ways is quite similar to the patron group that we're gathering with tonight because the British institution was an arts organization founded by philanthropically minded people in early 19th century London. Um, it hosted exhibitions. Um, as you see here on the right, this is an exhibition of historic continental old master paintings. Um, it ho hosted shows of contemporary art. It ran a painting school and it offered prizes for um, works that they found of artistic merit. Um, and it was unique within the London ecosystem because it was founded and run by wealthy connoisseurs and collectors rather than artists themselves, um, which believe you me, the artists had a couple things to say about that. It was not universally popular, this idea that the collectors should be in charge of the art world. Um, the mission. The mission of the British institution was not simply to support British art, but particularly to enable it to compete on the international stage. Why was this? The, the important context for founding this arts organization is international competition, war with France and competition for global territory. So what you're looking at now is a very humorous image of a very serious subject which is the race among European powers to, as you see here, carve up the world to establish global empires. And France and Britain in this moment are chief rivals. And it was explicitly the goal of the founders of the British institution to make sure that Britain could compete with France, not only in terms of empire building and military battles, but in the arts, to make sure that British art would measure up and be as good, if not better than French art. So there are participants in what you could think of as a kind of artistic arms race, if you will. To that end, they founded an organization um, that solicited membership from members of the public. Um, and 
some of their tactics in terms of recruiting support and maintaining support um, were really foundational for today's museum and arts culture. Um, so you see on the left, this is a list of subscribers. Um, and it might remind you of some of the lists of donors that you see today. Um, and in some ways, this was a very egalitarian move in the sense that anyone could become a subscriber and be part of this uh, nationalistic cause. On the other hand, it also preserved some aspects of social hierarchy. And I'm fascinated by on this list, you'll notice it's ostensibly alphabetical, but if you look really closely, you'll see that something's off. And within each letter grouping, it goes by social order of precedence rather than alphabetical order. So anyone with a peerage, a title, goes before the commoners. Um, and for people who were commoners, one of the exciting things about producing, participating in the British institution would have been seeing your name in print with the likes of the Earl of Dartmouth, for example. The other, um, tactic that you might uh, recognize from today's museum culture is the glamorous evening opening. And this is something that the British institution really pioneered. When they opened an exhibition, they would have parties in the evening that only patrons of the institution were invited um, to attend. And these were wildly popular and people could and did sign up for the institution to support the arts, basically so they could get tickets to these really great parties. So this project that I'm sharing with you tonight focuses on the very first exhibition that was ever staged at the institution. It was a show of contemporary British art that was for sale and it was held in 1806. And what you see here is a page from the catalog. Uh, one particular aspect I love of this copy of the catalog is you can see there's a pencil scribble and a French speaker has written down which paintings they find bon or good. Uh, so it's a, a little fragment of surviving criticism. This exhibition was organized by a group of British institution patrons, and you see here their portraits, their names, and also the various sources of wealth that enabled this patronage. Um, and you'll, they were from a variety of um, social backgrounds, um, a variety of political and artistic bents. They had different tastes in the art. Um, but the things that unify them is they were all men, they were all elite, and they were all extraordinarily wealthy. So there's a, there's a real uniformity to the leadership here. Now that really contrasts with the types of people who are represented in the artwork itself. And one reason why I started working on this exhibition was it quickly became clear to me that in the major works that were shown, as you see here, there's a real variety of different kinds of human beings from different parts of the planet, um, all brought together within the space of this exhibition. And so I became very interested in what this assemblage of artworks, um, again, with all of these different protagonists you see here, a Native American, a man of African descent in Suriname, um, an indigenous person from Peru, ostensibly, um, people in South Asia, events taking place in London, um, you know, this real global span. What was this exhibition saying about empire, about the British worldview, and particularly about this question of the relationships among different kinds of people in this imperial sphere? But first, to find that out, I had to be able to see it. And this is an exhibition for which there are no surviving images. So we, we have images of the space, like this painting, which is from later in the period. Um, but we don't have any images of the 1806 show um, and the building no longer exists. But fortunately, a man named Thomas Smith in the 1860s, before the building was torn down, measured everything. And I should light a candle every morning for Thomas Smith because without his measurements of this lost space, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, but he was a bit of an obsessive. He loved his statistics. And so he did measure all of the rooms and give us a sense of their scale. So working with Smith's records and also period images, which we use very critically because they are artistic representations that tend to interpret a space rather than be faithful diagrams. Um, we put those things together and the result is what you see on the right hand side, um, this kind of box that is the three dimensional model of the space. 
our next chat, and I should say um, that this is, you're seeing um, in the right hand side here, this diagram is the product of Madison's, Maddie's work. And um, I am an art historian. I am not a graphic designer or a digital whiz. And so it was absolutely essential for this project um, that I help, have help from someone who was. Um, and that is the case um, with Maddie being part of this. So um, Maddie was working in the art history department. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen here is her work. And it was a really exciting collaboration where I definitely benefited from her technical expertise, but much more than that, from her artist eye. She really helped make crucial design decisions about how we were going to visualize this lost space. So once we had the model of the space, then we had to figure out how each wall would look. And again, this was made possible by a surviving historic document. You see here the catalog provided the dimensions of each of the works shown, and that's really crucial. Um, and so we were able to create scale models of each wall um, and Maddie created for me a tool in which I could basically hang and rehang the exhibition, trying to figure out the order that I thought these paintings appeared on the wall. And so you see here, this is a very basic early working drawing um, where I'm trying to figure out where each picture goes. And in doing this, um, I'm deeply informed by period hanging conventions. There were customary practices in terms of how pictures were arranged. Symmetry is really important. Most pictures are hung in pairs of two. So I always say that paintings in this period are like earrings. You, you know, it's fashionable to have two of them, except when you're making a specific choice and then it's fashionable to have one. And so you can see on this diagram, there is a kind of bilateral symmetry and echoing, um, but there's still a fair amount of guesswork that goes into it. And the result of that, once we had sourced the images, is this. So this is a wall from the fully realized digital reconstruction. Um, there's the star there so you can see where we are within the space. Um, and this is the result of, again, a lot of design choices and use of period information. And something that's really important to me in terms of creating um, these digital reconstructions is being absolutely transparent with our audience about all of the choices that go into this. And the one thing that I really want to emphasize is visualizing uncertainty, because there are all sorts of things that we don't know about these spaces. Um, and also, as you'll see from this slide, there's a real variety of images that we're using. So many of the objects that were shown in 1806 do not survive. And so as you see here, we have photographs of oil paintings, but also a watercolor and some engravings that are standing in for objects that we can't locate. Um, and in the captions for this, we provide a lot of transparency about how we sourced our images, what their actual relationship is to the object that would have been shown. Um, but even here you get, I, I hope, a sense of the kind of the rhythm of this installation um, and the way that these very large pictures, even in this small sample, again, it showed a range of subject matter and a range of different kinds of people from around the world. Now, one of the things that became clear to us when um, we started working on this um, is something that I had known from the catalog, but is really striking once you can actually see it realized in the reconstruction, which is that they had taken um, the unusual step of arranging the exhibition by genre. So the first two galleries were reserved for what they called the higher branches of art, history painting, figure painting, which was considered the most intellectually challenging genre of art. And then the last gallery was reserved for the lesser genres, um, landscape, still life, animal painting, at that time considered less important. Um, and that last gallery was really not where you wanted your artwork to be hung as an artist because it was last in the tour of the exhibition, the catalog listed it last, and also the lighting was the worst. Um, so it was the hardest to see the artworks in this space. Um, and the exhibition organizers made this deliberate choice to foreground the works that they felt were the most important paintings. And that has some really interesting consequences, both um, for how um, we think about categorizing art and categorizing people. And I should also say that the reason that they're doing this arrangement by genre is again, it goes back to beating the French. 
you know, they want to make sure not only that they're sponsoring British art, but they're sponsoring British art in what is then considered the most ambitious categories. Um, and so these hierarchies of art um, and what's the most important can also be used to graph um, and create narratives about who the most important people are in a society. So that's what I'm gonna to turn to now, um, starting with this amazing watercolor um, that stands in for an oil painting that is not currently located of a man named Joseph Brandt or Tyan Denega. He has two names reflecting his identity as a Mohawk diplomat and warrior. He was a man who fought in the British army and indeed held the rank of captain in the British army and fought for the British with the British um, both in the Seven Years' War against French forces and then later in the American Revolution against American colonists. Um, and you'll notice that he's been given a very important place on the wall. So if placement creates meaning, there, there is a suggestion here that he is a member of a larger imagined British community except that cutting against that, when this portrait was exhibited, um, he was not given either of his names. Um, and I should say that, that Brandt Tyendenigo was a very well-known figure in London. He traveled to London twice on diplomatic missions. He had friends and contacts there. Um, so this is a man who was known in London, but when this portrait was exhibited, um, it was under the title, quote, the Mohawk chief. So it's an anonymous title. It really makes him a kind of ethnographic specimen rather than a known named individual. And even more shocking and um, telling is the treatment of another work of art that was not allowed into the first two galleries. Again, these mo these the, where all the most important works of art were gathered. Um, which also featured a life-size human figure. And that is this work um, by James Ward. The, I should say, again, with transparency, the work itself is lost. Um, so we don't have the 10 by 14 foot canvas um, that was shown in 1806. What we do have are these two extraordinary studies. Um, and as you can see, this is a very dramatic canvas featuring a man of African descent, um, riding on a horse, being attacked by a serpent. The name of the serpent tells us that this is set in Suriname, which is a South American colony that relied on enslaved labor. Um, and there's some thought that this image was possibly intended as an allegory of the international slave trade. Um, what we do know for certain is that this painting contained a full-size human protagonist, which plausibly could have qualified it for inclusion in the first two rooms. But that's not what happened. And as you can see in the visualization, um, it was put in that third room, that last room with the lesser genres, um, with the animal paintings and the still lives and the landscapes. Um, and that placement um, cannot have been accidental. That the organizers of this exhibition were making decisions about which were the most important works of art. And they were also making decisions about which kinds of humans they valued the most and which they perceived as being part of a broader British community. Um, and I think one of the things to, to realize about this is it, it gives us an opportunity to acknowledge and embrace the reality that artistic aesthetic hierarchies can also be social hierarchies. And they can also, as in this case, work to enforce ideas about perceptions of racial difference and racial hierarchy. Um, and that's something that we um, need to, I think especially in the discipline of art history, acknowledge that the history of aesthetics is not separate from the history of imperialism or the history of racism. Um, but to end on a more positive note, um, you know, that same power of art to convey meaning and the power of placement to convey meaning can be harnessed um, for positive developments. And so I wanted to end with another man on a horse, um, this time Kehende Wiley's um, sculpture, Rumors of War, which is Richmond's newest monument, and I think is also a testament to the power of placement. So now I'm gonna turn over um, to Kelly and she's gonna introduce Maddie, who's gonna share her, a little bit on her perspective of this project. Hi 
everyone. Can, am, I, am I here? Okay, everyone can hear me. Great, thanks. Um, welcome, we're so pleased that you could be with us this evening. Um, as the Dean mentioned, I'm Kelly Kerr, Director of Events, and I'm coming at you live from the Pollock Building here um, in my office. And uh, Professor Roach, thank you so much. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, before we get to those, um, Madison Westgate, a recent alumna of our graphic design program, of course, is with us tonight. And Maddie, I thought maybe we could start by giving you an opportunity to share some of your thoughts um, and this experience, this opportunity of collaborating with Professor Roach on this project. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I'm Maddie. I met Professor Roach while working at VCU's art history department and I collaborated with her to create the 3D model of the British institution. I also created and solved some design problems along the way that popped up. The project was a lot of fun. Um, I always loved working in 3D, but it's not every day that a graphic designer gets to branch out and work in 3D. So it was a lot of fun to get back into Google SketchUp and learn more about the program. And since then, it's helped me be able to create custom 3D objects or manipulate existing 3D objects for clients at my current job. So I'm really fortunate to be able to have been a part of the process. It taught me a lot about design collaboration. Um, in the classroom, you're responsible for your work. And if you don't do it, your grade goes down. But in the real world, if you don't do something, you get a lot worse than just a letter grade drop. You'll lose clients, you lose money, and you lose respect, you lose a lot more. So if I didn't do things in a timely manner with Professor Roach, then the whole thing just would have been backed up because of me, and that would have been bad. But this was also one of the first projects um, where I got to design and take on a design role and solve solutions to existing problems and not create them myself, like in the classroom. But um, Professor Roach touched on this before. It was important for us to remember that we weren't creating something new, that we were recreating something that had existed with information and research that uh, she already had. Um, and as an artist, this was new for me. It was new to not um, you know, create something that was my own opinion or my design. But it was our goal to make sure that people remembered that this is a 3D object on the computer and it's not the real British institution. So you might have noticed that on the model, it doesn't have ceilings, there's no texture on the wall, um, the frames are pixelated, all those things affect the way that you experience the model. And when you start adding the fine details in line, you kind of start blurring what is real and what is a rendering. But working alongside with Professor Roach was a great experience. It's one that helped me speak about my work to defend it and explain it. Uh, I couldn't rely on her to understand exactly what I was doing. The British institution was new for me, but the design process in creating a 3D model was new for her too. Um, so we had that back and forth collaboration of new versus old going on. But it was nice to be able to start explaining things before my career started. Um, and I'm not a working 3D designer, uh, even though this project doesn't scream graphic design, it helped me realize what I love about being a designer and not solving problems while creating visual experiences for people. Hey, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. One of our questions is actually directed to you. Cool. Um, Madison, was this the kind of project you expected to work on when you came to VCU Arts? Um, no, I don't know what I could say I expected from VCU Arts. Um, I knew that I wanted to be a graphic designer, but I think going into being what a graphic designer is, I didn't really know. Um, my high school, I did a graphic design program, but it was like one class. So I knew I wanted to design things, but didn't really know what. Excellent. Part of the pioneering. Um, Professor Roach, uh, this question is directed to you. On the donor list that you showed, there were a few women's names. Um, are these women who were listed with their husbands or were women involved as donors as well? Thank you, Kelly. Um, so yes, there were women on that list. Um, some of them were donating alongside their husbands, others in their own right. Um, you might've noticed fascinatingly to me, there is an unmarried woman with the 
the title Miss in front of her name who's donating. So in that sense, the institution was open to female participation. But as you saw from my slide of the exhibition organizers, the leadership was emphatically male. Um, and in fact, women um, who donated enough money that they would have been accorded a leadership position could vote um, in decisions about the institution, but they were not allowed to participate in the meetings. It would, was considered unseemly for a respectable woman to go to an otherwise all male meeting. So she would have had to send a male employee or relative to give her proxy. Excellent. That's so interesting and um, it's very appropriate, um, the donor list, because of course we recognize our Pollock Society donors and so, so much has changed, but not a whole lot has changed, right? Um, this question is um, regarding the design um, of the galleries. Are the gold frames and the red walls based on the paintings of the space, or was that a design choice that you and Madison made? Um, so I will speak to the general question, and then I'd love to have Maddie talk about the frames specifically. Um, so. We do know from historic sources, um, including the fact that they had to buy new wallpaper, which is very useful for the historian. So we, we, we have the bill for that. So we know that they were red wall colorings. Um, now, what exact shade of red, what texture, we don't know. And so that we know it was a kind of oxblood red um, from the period images and from the historical documents. Um, but beyond that, we don't have a sense, which is why it's, it's a little bit more um, cold and digital, you know, on purpose, because we're trying not to supply more information than we have. And Maddie, do you want to talk about the frames? Yeah, the frames. Um, the frames was one of the design solutions that uh, we had to come up with, because how do you represent frames that you don't currently have? We wanted to make sure that you would be able to realize that they weren't the actual frames that framed the objects. Um, so we chose to pixelate them a little bit to really enforce that digital feel throughout the whole model. Excellent, that's so interesting. Um, let's see, we do have another question regarding um, the placement of the paintings for you, Professor Roach. Um, why did they choose to include any of the lesser paintings in the last gallery? Instead of filling that with more history and um, figurative paintings, would um, these have helped show that British art was superior to French art? That's a great question. So the reason that they include these quote unquote lesser objects is because they don't have enough history paintings. And it's one of the fascinating dynamics of this event is that these British art patrons are trying to encourage British artists to do something that they haven't been doing as much because the market isn't there. So the market is in portraiture and landscape and animal paintings and everything that they're saying is less important. And so one of the fascinating things is that if you actually look close, and I get into this in the article, if you look closely at the contents of those first two rooms, there is some stuff that is not history painting for sure. You know, like, you know, cottage grandfathers and naughty sailors and you know things that are not serious or this kind of highbrow competitive mode that they wanted to be working in um, and that's part in part because when you put together an exhibition like this um, you also need to work with what artists have in their studios and if there's not big money in history painting artists aren't going to have that many history paintings uh, let's see this one is um for you again, Professor Roach. Um, you shared the picture of rumors of war at the VMFA. How do you think placement of artwork in public spaces creates meaning? Oh, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> That's some time, so yeah. dig deep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I think what's exciting about that is, um, and I, I love the contrast with the La Boya Serpent, which is a British painting that was created in the context of the transatlantic slave trade and has a man of African descent in a position of suffering and victimhood. And so I love the contrast with Gehandi Wiley's work in which you have a man of African descent in a very different cultural moment and a different cultural context. Um, and just the fact that he is now in that position of power of the traditional 
equestrian portrait of a ruler or a military leader being very powerful astride the back of a horse. I know that's an exciting um, addition to the iconography. And then in, in terms of place, you know, if we think of the built environment of Richmond and, you know, the fact that that work of art was created intentionally in, to be in conversation with Monument Avenue and to provide a different kind of horse and rider. Um, I think that is an exciting uh, example of how someone's, uh, an institution like the VMFA um, can be promoting a certain ideology, a certain message about power and identity. Um, and the tools are the same, even though the message is very different than what the patrons of the British institution would have understood or accepted. With, with that thought, um, how were we as, a, as colonies and then as in early America influenced by these attitudes of the British? Was that something that um, like clearly came, or were we cultivating these attitudes of what we memorialize um, on our own? That's a great question. Um, one of the fascinating things about studying the history of American art is for a long time, there was a nationalist investment in really trying to insist that American art had nothing to do with British art, right? Th th this had to be our homegrown American artistic tradition. And that meant sort of disavowing the fact that so many of the visual formulas um, for early American art came from the quote unquote mother country came from Britain. Um, there's some exciting scholarship that's going on now about sort of acknowledging those ties, acknowledging that heritage. And part, but part of that is also acknowledging that the sort of intense history of British hierarchical ordering of the world and thinking of European descended people as superior was baked into inextricable from those visual traditions. Um, and so you can see um, images, for example, of uh, European people with African servants that very blatantly suggest a kind of social hierarchy that are very similar on either side of the Atlantic. Um, let's see, we have one here, um, pretty straight, straightforward. How many paintings were actually displayed in the gallery? That's a great question. Um, I should have said that. Thank you for asking. Um, it was a little bit shy of 200. And that includes everything from the, you know, the big 14 footer James Ward painting um, down to a little miniature that would be that big that you could hold in your hand. Um, and there were also sculptures of various scales. There were works in wax. Um, so the most visually prominent aspect of the exhibition were the wall-to-wall -wall oil paintings, um, but there were a variety of media represented. And was the British institution ultimately successful in creating a market for history and figure painting? Yes and no. <laughs> there was not a sudden boom in buying history paintings the way they really hoped there would be. Um, they were successful in the sense that they did fund project themselves. So they commissioned um, ambitious history paintings from artists um, and sort of caused those to come into being, but they didn't make it fashionable in the way that portraiture was truly fashionable and highly marketable. Um, but what they did do is they convinced the British government that the government had a role in art patronage. And so without the British institution, it might well have taken a lot longer for the British government to found a National Gallery of Art, um, which they did in the 1820s. And the British institution immediately started using their resources to donate works of art to that very young museum. Um, so they were successful in changing art policy, um, but there was not a history painting revolution coming out of it. Did you have a favorite painting that was in that exhibition? Ooh, um, I actually just showed you a snippet of it um, when in the with the circles with the variety. There's a painting by Thomas Lawrence, the portrait artist, of an actor playing the role of an indigenous Peruvian saving a baby from Spanish uh, conquistadors. Um, and it is truly one of the weirdest paintings the 19th century ever produced, and I adore it. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> um, let's see here. 
Is this the first time, this collaboration, was this the first time that you worked with a student in this way? And what did you learn from working with Madison? Oh, what a great question. Um, yes, it was. Um, so I've done um, exhibition reconstructions before, but when that project, I was actually working with professional video game designers. Uh, and there's a huge overlap between exhibition reconstruction and video game technology because it demands the same kind of visualization. Uh, but this was my first opportunity to work with a student and it was tremendous. I learned so much from Maddie about problem solving and we spent literally hours in the art history office um, looking at renderings, looking at particular design solutions. Um, one challenge was what to do about the sculpture because there were large scale sculptures in the space, but we only know of one that I actually have a photograph of. And so it was, we went back and forth about, you know, pixelated sculpture blobs that would stand in for those missing sculptures. Um, the, the solution that we actually came to, which I think is very elegant, is there's simply a circle on the floor that sort of creates a void that shows you that there is a three dimensional object there that we can't represent. Um, and that was something I, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. And it really helped to have Maddie's um, not only just, you know, that it was so much more than just that she understood SketchUp and I didn't, it was that she is an artist and a designer. And so she helped me come up with visual solutions for some of these intellectual problems. Yeah, you referenced um, a lot of the information came from historic records. Um, do you know why exactly the man who measured everything in the British institution did that and why he documented it so thoroughly? Uh, so Thomas Smith, bless his heart, was not a beautifully poetic writer. And he wanted to do a book about the British institution and his place of safety and joy, as far as I can tell, was statistics. So there are lots of lists of how many paintings were sold and for what amount of money. Um, it does not, I will say, make for really exciting reading because it's a bunch of numbers, but it's to the historian, it's just such a gift in terms of, um, you know, there's just the, the sheer amount of numerical information that he tabulated. Um, you know, he, he doesn't really write about anything I'm talking about, about ideas about empire, about, you know, historical genre. It's just kind of a very straightforward, as factual as possible and God bless him for it. Now, your article that is forthcoming in the journal Art History, when, when can we anticipate um, that being published? Oh, as soon as I know, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, it's, I do know it will be sometime in 2021, and it will be available both digitally and in print. Um, so watch this space. And will that article focus on this research specifically? Yes, and it does a much more detailed dive, um, walking through each of the rooms and looking at the, the principal exhibits, those very large oil paintings, um, and, and telling this, you know, I just gave you a little a snippet tonight of this larger story of the kind of British racial imagination in this moment. Well, let's see if we have any more questions coming in. Are there are there, is there more information that you'd like to share with us about what this kind of technology means as an educator, as working students, as this interdisciplinary um, you know, effort that seems to kind of happen organically and sometimes it's planned um, in the culture here at BCU Art? Yeah, well, it is one of the glorious things about working in an art school is sort of, you know, I was in the chair of the art history department's office saying, you know, I have this idea for a project, but I don't know how to make it real. And it was almost like she was saying, like, I have a talented graphic designer right here um, because Maddie was working in the office at the time. And so it was, um, I mean, that's a great thing about being surrounded by creators and artists is that you have that talent pool. Um, so that we were able to make this happen. Um, and I think that is one of, you know, what a research university is meant to do is to have people who are pro actively producing knowledge, both sharing that knowledge with their students, but also working with students to create the next generation of knowledge producers. And, um, you know, collaborating with Maddie was such a great example of that, um, where she was learning about art history, I was learning about graphic design. Um, 
And it's just, it's, that's one of the great things about having an art history department within the School of the Arts is that we are people who study creators and we are surrounded by creators. And we're surrounded by so many talented students. I can certainly speak to that. Um, I don't know how I would get what I get done without the help of our talented study students. Um, so as we start to finish up here, um, I would first like to thank you so much, Madison, for joining us tonight. Um, it's really exciting to hear that you're working here in Richmond. Um, and we look forward to hearing what you're going to be doing in the future and staying in touch. And Professor Vogt, hey, this has been tremendous. Um, thank you for sharing your research with us and answering our questions and providing these opportunities for our students, which um, they're great stories to tell and um, like fun evening. And for all of you who have joined us, Pollock Society and our members of our faculty and our community, um, it's been a real pleasure to be with you tonight. And I should say um, that our next program that's coming up on November 10th will be with um, our VCU Arts Theater uh, professor, Elizabeth Bylan, and uh, she will be speaking to us about the power of improv. And invitations will be extended, and you'll learn more about that um, program coming up soon. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the many ways that you support us. And if you have questions or if you just want to reach out and tell us how you are or what you're doing, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, and I see that we have faculty congratulating you, Kate. <laughs> Bob, we love the way you show the missing work. And um, one last question regarding the works in the exhibition. What percentage were you able to actually locate for your reconstruction? Just please one more question in here. Um, and is there hope for Oh, that's a great question. Um, so as Maddie knows, we built this such that in the future, if I or someone else wanted to do a full reconstruction, the full scale model is there. So every painting has a scale representation of an empty frame. Um, that said, um, it would take a lot of art historian and designer hours, uh, particularly trying to locate all of these lost you know, or unlocated works. Um, nothing is ever truly lost. Um, and there is the possibility of a full reconstruction, um, but it would take a lot of time. <laughs> and there, would just, there will be inevitably artworks that are um, simply lost to time. So that's one of the challenges. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Thank you, everyone. Be well, and we hope to see you November 10th. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you. So nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Good night.